Construction of Genomic DNA Library. So let us look at the learning outcomes of this session. Genomic DNA Library is a collection of clones that contains in them the entire chromosomal DNA of a single organism. Now, uh, formation of the Genomic DNA Library entails the use of gene cloning workflow. And we all know what is the gene cloning workflow. The isolated DNA are cleaved into suitable size of fragments using complete or partial restriction digestion. And then these suitable vectors are used to insert the DNA fragments depending on the size of the genome and the size of the fragments obtained thereof. So what is a genomic library? Say for example, you have E. coli which has a genome size of 4,600 kilobase. That means you have uh, a, a small genome per se when you compare it to human genome or plant genome. But nevertheless, this 4,600 KB would contain about 4,000 genes. So effectively, when, you want, when one thinks of a library, and suppose you have a section on biochemistry or section of biotechnology, you exactly know where to go in the library and look for books. And within that library, if you need a book for molecular biology, you will again have several mall bio uh, uh, books and from which you can choose one. So effectively, a library is, a, uh, is, a, is basically a, a consortium of a lot of knowledge stored in the form of books. And you can actually select a book and take for your reading. Similarly, in this case, if there are 4,000 genes, then 4,000 genes is a library. And from these 4,000 genes, you can go and select the gene of your choice. So as a simile or as analogous to a library, genomic library is also a collection of books, rather a collection of DNA of a single organism. So single organism here say you can be you can make it analogous to biochemistry. So that way you can have for every organism a genomic library prepared. So how or what uh, therefore would you understand by uh, this that suppose within this genome is present the lag Z gene. Then from the 4000 genes you would require the lag Z genes. So the the question now to be asked is, so uh, this is a single genome. From the single genome, how do you get the lag Z? And how is the library formed? So what is, what is generally done and how is the lag Z obtained? So to get the lag Z, you will have a collection of clones. And each clone would contain probably one gene. So from these clones, you will have one clone that is containing the lag Z gene. So this library of clones could refer to each clone containing a single gene. And you may have more than one copy of this clone present. So multiple copies may be available. So therefore, a library of clones is basically organism specific collection of DNA. And the organism specific collection of DNA or the library comprises the coding genes, that means those genes that are going to give rise to a protein, non coding genes, so for example, rRNA, tRNA, uh, mRNA, uh, tRNA, siRNA, snRNA, all of these form and fall under what is called as non coding genes. Intervening sequences promoters and transmit trans and terminators so all of these genes okay or dna when present in a single library of clones then that is what is called as genomic library now how is the genomic library prepared so since you have to prepare say for example the uh, library for this particular bacteria so the first step that has to be done is that the genome has to be isolated and that can be done by uh, 
very specific protocols that are used for genomic DNA isolation. So if it is bacteria, you will have a protocol for uh, isolating the DNA by lysing the cell. And then after lysing the cell, you can carry out phenol chloroform denaturation of proteins and then alcohol precipitation of the DNA. If you're using plants, you can carry out the purification or isolation by CTAB method. If you have an animal cell, then again lysis and then carry out phenol chloroform or sodium acetate uh, uh, precipitation to get the pure DNA. Now this genomic DNA is then cleaved into different fragments. And the cleaving of these fragments are generally done with restriction endonucleases. Uh, most most, mostly partial digestion is carried out, but complete digestion can also be carried out. Partial digestion would generally give you uh, fragments that are more or less similar in size. And then these fragments are further cloned into suitable vectors. The word suitable vectors indicate over here is that vectors itself have different capacities of uh, inserting a uh, particular DNA. So the size, insert size would be a limitation for a particular vector. So for example, you have plasmid DNA, then it can uh, uh, can uh, take up an insert of around 15 KB or little less, okay, or even lesser. So based on what is the size of the fragments obtained, one has to select a choice, a particular suitable vector. Once cloned, so once these fragments are cloned into these suitable vectors, then they are transfected into bacteria. And these transformed bacteria are then grown in a plate and the colonies that are formed are actually multiple clones of the uh, DNA that is obtained from this particular bacteria. So all these colonies that you observe in the plate are, are basically clones of the DNA that has been um, obtained from this particular bacteria. So therefore, this becomes the genomic DNA library for this particular bacteria. Now, the vectors that are used to prepare genomic DNA library will depend on what is the size of the genome itself. Now, when you look at the suitable vectors, if you, if you take the lambda phage, insert size is somewhere around 25 kb. If you take cosmid vectors, the insert size is 45 kb. If you take bacterial artificial chromosome, the insert size can vary from 120 to 300 kb. And if you take yeast artificial chromosome, then the insert size can vary from 250 to 2000 kb. So if you are taking a bacteria, and you want to create a genomic DNA library for the bacteria, then you can either, either go in for a lambda phage or you can go in for a cosmid vector. But if you are trying to create or prepare a genomic library of a plant cell, then if you were to take the DNA fragmented and put it into a cosmid vector, the number of clones that would be needed to uh, house the entire DNA of the um, plant cell would be humongous and to screen all those to identify a clone that contains your interest of gene would be a very tedious task. So therefore to have a relatively lesser number of clones one would definitely try to go in for a vector that can store larger fragments of DNA. And so for plant genome or for human genome or for mammalian genomes, people would prefer to go in for bacterial artificial chromosomes or yeast artificial chromosome, more preferably yeast artificial chromosome because each yeast artificial chromosome can accommodate 2000 KB of DNA within one clone. So that is why this is extremely important. Choosing of the suitable vector is important. Keeping in mind that screening ultimately of the library to get the gene of interest is very, very important. And how difficult it is to get that gene of interest uh, would depend on what is the 
uh, clone or what is the uh, suitable vector that has been used. So this is what was mentioned for plant genome, animal cell genome and human genome. People would prefer to go in for those vectors that take up a larger um, DNA size. Now bactinal artificial chromosome is of course a artificial construct uh, which has uh, three areas that are very important. One, it has what is called as the PAR genes. These are basically F plasmids, so this makes it conjugative. And uh, it has selectable markers that allows it to have multiple cloning sites within which the genes can be inserted. So selection of the artificial chromosome is also good. Its size is 7507 base pair, but it can take up anywhere up to 300 KB. So it can accommodate a large num size of DNA. So therefore, BAC is important for genomic DNA library construction. Similarly, the yeast artificial chromosome is also an attractive suitable vector for uh, preparing genomic DNA library. So um, uh, yeah, that is a yeast artificial chromosome has certain features of the yeast itself. And therefore, such clones can be transfected into yeast. So it has uh, ARS1. This is basically the origin of replication. It has the SEN fr fragment. This is important. Why? Because if the chromosome has to be, if the chromosome has to be transferred to the next generation, then uh, the yeast artificial chromosome should be able to segregate during cell division and should be able to transfer to the uh, consecutive generation. So therefore, this is important. Uh, one should also have what is called as a telomeric region because then the DNA will be protected from any kind of uh, exonucleases and the DNA inserted within will be uh, preserved. Then, of course, one has several selectable markers like SUP4 or URA3. Uh, so these allow uh, one to choose, the, uh, select the, uh, the yeast that have been transfected. And of course, one has several, um, you know, um, restriction endonucleases wherein you can insert the DNA of choice. This can accommodate a very large DNA insert of up to about 2000 kilobase also. So let us make the conclusions. The genomic DNA is isolated from the respective source cell by following a suitable isolation workflow. The isolated DNA are cleaved into fragments and each fragment inserted into a suitable vector, which in turn is transformed into a host organism. The genome that is large is cleaved into large DNA fragments to prepare a library, as smaller fragments would lead to a very huge library, which in turn would be tedious to screen. Large DNA fragments are therefore cloned into vectors like bacterial artificial chromosome and yeast artificial chromosome to ensure a library that can be screened for a gene of interest. A way of representing genome sequence information with multiple small fragments forming a library of DNA of a single organism is what is genomic library. This genomic library will have to be screened to obtain the clone of a single gene. Thank you.